Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Understanding LED's webinar. My name is Beth, and I'll be hosting today's webinar, which means I'll be monitoring the chat window and conducting some polling at the end of the webinar. Today, we'll be covering highlights from our half-day seminar, LED Lighting, Changing All the Rules. Our hope is that after today, you'll be able to understand some of the fundamentals of lighting and LEDs and be able to apply them to your facility to help you save energy and money. We want to thank our sponsors today, the Energy Trust of Oregon and Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Based on our customer feedback, we know that they appreciate that we're aligned with these two organizations to help eliminate any confusion regarding energy efficiency and renewables. Before I introduce the presenter today, I'd like to show you some of the tools you'll be using during the webinar. To the right of your screen, you'll see several windows, the chat window, excuse me, the participants window on the top, the chat window, and then um, the polling window, which will appear at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions today during the webinar, please feel free to submit them to me, the host, uh, through chat, and the instructor will answer them at the end of the webinar. This will be an informal session today, so if you'd like to share an example or you have questions you'd like the instructor to address immediately, you can use the raise your hand, you can raise your hand using the raise hand icon, which is at the bottom of the participants window. At the top left corner of your screen, underneath the quick start tab, you'll see some tools which I'm underlining here, the, an arrow, a text tool, various other tools. Um, the instructor will indicate when he wants you to use these during the presentation, and um, so at that point you can uh, try those out. And at this moment, I'd like to introduce Mark Whitney, our presenter for today. Mark has worked as a lighting specialist at PGE for over 17 years, and he currently provides technical lighting support for our commercial and industrial customers. This support can include an on-site consultation and help getting involved with Energy Trust efficiency programs. Mark is active with the Portland, Oregon section of the Illuminating Engineering Society, and he is, a light, he is lighting certified and an LED accredited professional. And now I would like to hand the presentation over to Mark. Mark, you may start. Great. Thanks, Beth. Welcome, everyone, to today's lighting webinar. And thanks for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule to learn about LEDs and how that could help you make lighting upgrade decisions. So this webinar was designed with PGE end use customers in mind, particularly those that are qualify for Energy Trust of Oregon cash incentives. However, this LED webinar will be beneficial for all listeners today. LEDs, which stand for light emitting diodes, are creating a revolution in lighting because they offer many advantages that other light sources can't provide nearly as well. However, they are not always the best or even the most efficient option now for many applications. This webinar will help you decide which LEDs are ready for you now and which ones are ready in the near future. So here's today's agenda. Keep in mind that throughout the presentation, I will be focusing on saving energy, saving money, and providing better quality lighting through a lighting upgrade project. So the goal today is to supply you with information about LED lighting and energy efficiency that will make a difference at your place of business. So we invite your active participation today and plan to leave 10 minutes at the end to answer questions. These are the key learning objectives today. And this is also a good time to uh, practice some of the tools that Beth uh, talked to you about in, your, in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, an arrow works good, or you can uh, have a drawing tool to do circles or check marks or something like that. Uh, so if you want to indicate which one of these uh, key learning objectives is of most interest to you today, uh, again, a good time to practice your tools and uh, also give me some information. So this webinar is not going to go in depth on how LEDs work, but I will go over some basics. And throughout the presentation, I'll talk about familiar lighting technologies and what the LED alternatives are. The focus is going to be on retrofit, but new construction applies also. Keep in mind that some LED applications make sense right now, while some need to mature or become less expensive. Near the end, I'll show you 
how you can get help with your lighting upgrade project. So what's all the fuss about? You're probably hearing a lot about LEDs, and there's a wide range of quality and performance, so you need to be informed in order to make good choices. These pictures represent some recent award winners. Some are from the Next Generation Luminaires competition, and others are from the Lighting for Tomorrow uh, competition. These are winners from 2011. If you go to these websites, you can see pictures of this year's winners. Here's a graph I wanted to show you that uh, breaks out the uh, lighting electricity consumption by sector and lamp type. You can see that residential is dominated by incandescent lamps, while the commercial sector uses mostly fluorescents and mostly T8s. Uh, industrial and uh, uh, outdoor lighting uses a lot of HID, and that would be uh, high pressure sodium and metal halide. Now, if you look closely, right down here at the bottom of the total, you're going to see a thin yellow line that represents LED. And it's easy to see that that is not a whole lot of LEDs yet. But that's going to change. This graph illustrates the dramatic growth that's expected from LEDs in the not too distant future. 2015 is just a couple of years away. And most of the uh, most of the LEDs are going to be replacing conventional technology. So what is an LED? So LEDs are a type of solid state lighting. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the technical side because of time, and also that the technical side is not my uh, strength or my expertise. But to keep it simple, an LED is a semiconductor device that generates light. And it generates light by the movement of electrons through a semiconductor material, which illuminates the tiny light sources we call LEDs. And that light takes place at the, the positive-negative junction. That's where the light comes out. So LED products use light-emitting diodes to produce light very efficiently. But you can't just have a, a, a chip. You have to have other parts to make an LED. You need uh, something that uh, connects it to the, uh, to the electricity. You need uh, a package to kind of hold it all together. You're going to need a heat sink to remove all the heat that's generated at that positive negative junction. And you're usually going to have some type of a lens that is designed to direct the light where you want it to go for your particular fixture or lamp. So to make white light, there's two main ways. One is uh, to use a blue or violet LED, and then you coat it with phosphors, which is similar to the technique that is used for fluorescent lighting. Uh, the other one is using a combination of red, green, and blue LEDs. And you can vary the intensity of each of these LEDs to not only create various shades of white, but you can produce virtually any color that you want but you'll find that this method is used primarily in theatrical lighting. So why do, you use, why do we use LEDs? Um, one main reason is the efficiency. This graph illustrates uh, historically uh, some of the common light sources like fluorescent and incandescent and uh, HID, and some of the advancements that have been made over the years. And you'll notice here that uh, LEDs and OLEDs, which we're not going to address today, um, have just been introduced just within the last decade or so. But you can see the expected rapid advancement that we're going to be seeing from white LEDs. It's going to be quite dramatic. Another reason to use LEDs is because they have a long lamp life. It's easy to find LEDs that have 35,000, 50,000, 100,000 hours of life or more. And that potential for lamp life seems to increase all the time. As we mentioned, it's a, a focused and directional light source. So this is advantageous for some applications, but for others, this directionality is uh, more challenging and problematic. 
the LEDs themselves are very small, but because they need a heat sink, when you get into the uh, bigger uh, lumen output uh, fixtures, they're going to need a heat sink and some kind of uh, uh, a fixture framing of some kind. So they're sometimes the small LEDs can turn out to be pretty big. Dimmability is a strong feature of LEDs. However, compatibility with existing dimmers is an issue. We're going to look at three big no's, and one of the no's is no mercury. It, they don't emit any ultraviolet, and even though they do generate heat, it's not in the form of infrared heat like you get from the common light bulb. This chart illustrates the historical and predictive trend of LED light output and show how the light out output increases along with a concurrent cost decrease. This is known as Haight's Law, and it states that the cost per lumen falls by a factor of 10 every decade, and the amount of light generated per LED package increases by a factor of 20. So this is similar to the familiar Moore's Law that applies to computer chips and the advancements that we've seen in the uh, semiconductor industry. Keep in mind, while this law has held true in the past, the advances are starting to slow down just a little bit. Some of the challenges and issues that we have with LEDs, one is thermal management. Again, getting that heat away from that junction. And it has conductive heat. You'll see down here at the bottom, uh, we have some common uh, LED uh, light bulb replacements, and they all have a slightly different way of dealing with the heat. This one has uh, some very uh, distinct uh, aluminum uh, fins on it, uh, as does the Sylvania. Uh, Switch actually uses something different. They have a liquid-cooled LED, and that's pretty unique, although one of the disadvantages that makes the LED kind of heavy. Uh, lamp life, traditionally lamps uh, are rated, their lamp life is rated when a representative uh, sample, when 50% of them fail, that's designated as the lamp life. With LEDs, it is measured in the useful life. It's when the life falls below 70% uh, of its original output, that's considered to be a uh, failure or the useful life has has uh, has expired. But there's other things in an LED that can fail uh, besides the LED itself, uh, like the driver and electronic components and so on. So the lumens per watt is really good for a lot of applications. 60 to 90 is very typical, with the potential being higher than uh, 200 lumens per watt. Most LEDs are fairly expensive. So we need to get the cost down. For demanding applications, the color and performance may not be as good as we need it. But for most applications, it's pretty good. A flicker and dimming is an issue with LEDs. When you dim them, many LEDs tend to, tend to flicker. And some LEDs don't work on existing dimmers. So how to specify LEDs? It's a, it's a whole new ball game. It's a new technology. And we need a lot of education and training. Fortunately, the government is here to help. And the Department of Energy is taking the lead in developing and promoting energy efficient solid state lighting. This website that you see at the bottom is definitely one that if you don't know it already, you want to copy down and take a look at. One of the things that uh, the Department of Energy does is they do research and development. They do activities that identify ways to make LEDs more efficient and less expensive to uh, manufacture. They also are promoting uh, making as many components as possible right here in the United States. Demonstration projects are very helpful in finding out how LEDs perform in the real world, and you can find uh, a lot of examples of these on the website. Any, to, any new technology needs to be tested in order to gain confidence in their performance claims. So standards for testing are critical for consumer confidence. 
Product competitions have challenged manufacturers to create better market-ready products, such as the Next Generation Luminaires and the uh, L-Prize, which uh, was won by Philips for their 60-watt replacement lamp. End users need help and confidence when choosing to buy LED products. So good and useful labeling, along with uh, educational resources, are available, again, on this website. One of the things that helps consumers, retailers, and utilities is the Lighting Facts label, which allows you to compare products against the manufacturer claims. And this label provides a quick summary of product information in five key areas. So one way to think about this is uh, like a nutrition label that gives you information about the food that you eat. So you're going to get information on this label, which, by the way, is a voluntary label, and the information is supplied by the manufacturers. Uh, however, uh, Lighting Facts is going to be doing some testing that will um, add some validity and a little bit teeth in this, this labeling. So Lumens uh, is going to be measuring the, um, the light output. Watts is the energy used. And efficacy, again, your, like your miles per gallon for lighting, this is uh, your lumens per watt. Uh, in this case, 93 would be very good. It also has a, a little chart here that uh, shows you where this particular product falls as far as its color temperature as well as the color rendering index. This is a, a 0 to 100 scale, with 100 being the best. In this case, an 87 CRI would be uh, a very good CRI. So Caliper. Caliper is like the consumer reports of solid state lighting. LED products are obtained anonymously and thoroughly tested. And then periodic reports are posted online for everybody to take a look at. They start out with a summary report that gives you an overview, and then they follow that up with a detailed report, which provides much more product-specific information. So you're actually able to identify the products that they tested. And again, uh, this is the website you want to go to to find this information. The Department of Energy works closely with a network of standards setting organizations, and they offer technical assistance and support. Uh, some of the current standards that are important, one you might be fam familiar with is LM79, and this uh, provides a standard testing method for LED products. Now keep in mind, just because a product was tested according to LM79 standards doesn't mean it's a good product. It only means that it was evaluated properly. LM80 provides a method for measuring the lumen depreciation of LEDs, while the TM21 uh, provides a method that allows you to take the information you got from LM80 and make a projection about the lumen maintenance of LED light sources. So these standards are very helpful and serve as a starting point for evaluating uh, any LED product that you might be considering. Energy Trust has cash incentives, but they're only available for approved LED products. And you can find the list of approved products on this website for the Lighting Design Lab. So the Lighting Design Lab has products on their list that have not yet made uh, the Energy Star or the Design Lights Consortium list. But they've found that there are LED lamps and fixtures that are expected to qualify for these lists, but usually because they haven't uh, fulfilled the lifetime testing requirement, uh, they haven't made the Energy Star Design Lights Consortium list yet. So the, the Lighting Design Lab list is a temporary list, and LED products can only remain on their list for a maximum of one year. And the Energy Trust uh, recognizes any LED lamp or fixture that is included on, on any of these three lists. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and just to lay a little background of how uh, uh, lamps in general are designated, the nomenclature. Typically, they're going to have a letter, and this designates the relative shape of a lamp, while the number is going to designate the maximum diameter of that lamp in eighths of an inch. 
So a common example here is your T8, where the T8 stands for tubular and the 8 stands for 8 eighths or 1 inch. Some others that we have on this page here, a G stands for globe and 30 eighths of an inch maximum diameter. A reflector lamp, uh, again an R30, a, a multifaceted reflector uh, 16, MR16. This one has a shape of a candle, so that's why it has the CA and 10 has a 10 eighths of an inch. Your common light bulb is uh, known as uh, A lamp, stands for arbitrary. And over here we have a PAR lamp, which stands for parabolic aluminized reflector, which is a long way of saying that it has a very uh, engineered reflector for getting the light out of a of a lamp very efficiently. So what's interesting to note here is that uh, LEDs that have a similar shape are also called a PAR lamp, even though they don't have any reflector like a halogen lamp does at all. But they keep the letter designations because of user familiarity. One of the main replacement targets for LED is the ordinary light bulb. Now, even though this is primarily a residential uh, application. You're going to find these in commercial as well. But it's a good place to start in talking about comparing uh, LEDs with their uh, in incumbent technologies. So generally speaking, you're going to have three options for the ordinary light bulb. One is going to be an energy saving uh, incandescent, better known as a halogen. Uh, CFLs are better. Uh, they can save up to 75%. LEDs are going to save 75% or more and are considered to be the, the best or most efficient light source out there right now. But your application may call for something other than LED. So it's good to know the characteristics of each of these sources. Uh, lamp life is important. Uh, even the, the halogens probably at best have 3,000, maybe 5,000 hours, still not very much when you compare it to compact fluorescence. And then you go to LEDs, which for uh, replacement bulbs can be 50,000 hours. But LEDs are going to cost much more than the uh, other options. Dimming, we all know that incandescents and halogens dim very well. LEDs, some do, some don't. And CFLs do not have a very good reputation for dimming. In fact, they have to be designated as dimmable in order to dim. Color quality is excellent, except most people would say that CFLs is only at best very good. So here's some examples from the big three, GE, Philips, and Sylvania. So again, energy saving incandescence still makes sense for applications with low hours of operation, like a walk-in closet or a storage room or perhaps where you want dimming and you like the warm color temperature shift that incandescence will give you. Uh, compact fluorescents are going to be for applications with longer hours of operation and especially ones that don't have need for dimming. LEDs are going to be best for applications with very long hours of operation or perhaps where replacing that bulb is very expensive or difficult. And if you want dimming, because LEDs don't mind frequent switching. Light bulb distribution is going to be important when you get uh, replacement light bulbs. Remember that one of the strengths for LEDs is they're very directional. So this makes it a challenge when you want to make an omnidirectional light bulb, uh, make an omnidirectional light bulb because uh, of the directional nature of the LEDs. So this means that you need to pay attention when buying an LED replacement bulb. So the bulbs on the left and on the right do a pretty good job of replicating an ordinary light bulb, with this one on the right having a little bit more light output. But you'll notice that this one in this middle, and there's, there's a lot of companies that make one like this, uh, the light is going more in one direction. As you can imagine, this would be a terrible replacement lamp for a table lamp, where you want most of the light coming down for reading. But let's say we take these and we mount them differently. Let's mount them upside down. And now, if you wanted to have the light 
be more directional, then having the light come down would be a pretty good idea, maybe like a, a task light or something like that. So important thing here is just keep in mind that all replacement light bulbs and their light output is not are not the same. Now we're going to use an example of when we put um, a light bulb or a lamp inside a fixture. And we're going to use an example here of a compact fluorescent. So efficacy is a term, as, as we've indicated, that indicates the lumens per watt of a light source. In this case, we have a CFL with an efficacy of 60 lumens per watt. However, once you put it into a fixture that only is 58% efficient, that means that 42% uh, uh, of the light is bouncing around in that fixture, and never makes it out. So the delivered lumens is only 35 lumens per watt. So an LED downlight, uh, a fixture or retrofit kit, is tested in a manner that rates the lumens per watt for the entire fixture as opposed to the CFL where just the lamp itself is tested. That's why the LED downlight is rated at 100% efficient. So all of the lumens that it is rated for are going to be delivered into the room. So it's going to have a delivered efficacy of 70 lumens per watt. So in the, this example, that's twice as many lumens per watt. So to have an equivalent uh, lumen output, you would only need a 13 watt LED versus a 26 watt CFL. Let's turn our attention now to track lights. So we're going to find out in a few minutes the many reasons why this is one of the very best LED applications right now, especially for retail stores and restaurants. It's an excellent uh, replacement option for halogens. And again, keep in mind when I use the term halogen, it refers to a more efficient type of incandescent lamp. Okay, this busy slide, I put this up here because uh, most people are aware that there's efficiency laws for the common light bulb, but you may not be aware that uh, recent laws affect a lot of reflector and uh, PAR lamps as well. So the bottom line is that in the future, as soon as stock runs out, you're going to have to get an infrared version of a halogen in order to comply with these new lighting laws. But better yet, upgrade to LED. So in, until just recently, there just really hasn't been an acceptable alternative for halogen reflector lamps for track lighting. Uh, CFLs were tried, but they have a poor beam pattern, and the color quality just wasn't good enough for uh, retail applications. Ceramic metal halide lamps uh, have been a reasonable choice, but never really caught on, and they have some short, shortcomings in light quality and lamp life, as well as being expensive. So screw-in LED replacement directional lamps have improved to the point where they're now an excellent alternative to halogen. They have excellent energy savings, color quality, long lamp life, which is what makes them a compelling choice. But keep in mind, even if they didn't save any energy, it would still be cheaper to buy uh, an LED replacement at $50 instead of buying 10 halogens at $10 each over time. And think about the hassle of changing those 10 lamps. However, LEDs do save, and they do save a lot of energy, and they qualify for generous cash incentives through the Energy Trust of Oregon, which end up covering about half of the lamp cost, which gives you paybacks of one to one and a half years. Now you can get a uh, incentive through Energy Trust for a replacement fixture, uh, but it must be an approved product and meet all program criteria in order to qualify for that incentive. Once you decide you want to go with LED replacement lamps, it's a good time to evaluate your options since you're going to live with your choice for about 10 years or so. In this way, buying an LED is more like choosing an appliance than it is a light bulb. So it's best to get a few samples, try them out. You'll find that directional lamps uh, are commonly made with beam angles from about 10 to uh, 60 degrees. And with LED, the, the choices that are most available are, seem to be 25 and 40 degrees. 
So which beam angle you choose depends in part on the mounting heights and also the distance to the objects that you want illuminated. The center beam candle power will also help determine how brightly those objects will be uh, illuminated. And you can usually find this on the box or you may have to go to the product website to get the center beam candle power. Once you're trying them out, you want to look for smooth tapered edges and no dark spots, streaking, and not, uh, not any variation in, uh, in color. Now with your, your bigger LED lamps, like your PAR 38s, they have an easy time dissipating the heat because of their large size. But when you want to get more light output out of a, uh, like an MR16 or a, a PAR16 or some of these smaller uh, candle style bulbs, it's more difficult because it's challenging to make a heat sink to uh, get all the heat out when you have a higher wattage uh, LED. So in, in just, uh, just a second, I'm going to ask you to use uh, one of your tools, maybe the arrow or the marking tools. Um, so pick one of those. So some companies cheat a little bit by making their MR16s slightly bigger than the standard MR16s. So can you pick out the guilty offenders from this lineup? Which ones don't match the halogens on the far right? There's two halogens on the far right. So that's right, the two tall guys on the left are the guilty offenders. Now this might be okay if, if the lamp uh, LED lamp sticks out a little bit, but it may not fit in some fixtures. So again, you need to try them out before you buy a large quantity. Most of your larger PAR lamps are going to come with a standard uh, Edison E26 medium base, while some of the uh, smaller uh, candelabras, uh, uh, candles, are going to have this candelabra or an intermediate base. And if you need to make them fit in a regular uh, standard socket, you can uh, get an adapter socket to make them fit. That's quite acceptable. Uh, your MR16s, this is a, a base of an MR16. Uh, these are uh, going to be low voltage. And they're going to come with uh, pin bases uh, that are 5.3 millimeters apart. Now a GU10 is going to refer to a, a line voltage lamp. These are often PAR 16s and PAR 20s. They have a uh, push and turn base that looks like this. And the pins are uh, 10 millimeters apart. So this illustrates again that you need to know what kind of lamp you're replacing so that you can get the correct LED replacement. Okay, we're gonna switch gear again gears again, and we're going to talk about uh, linear fluorescent, the battle between fluorescent and LED. Which one is better? Um, so LED directional replacement lamps are examples of upgrade options that make sense right now. But uh, the linear uh, fluorescent fixtures, uh, they work pretty well. Linear fluorescent works pretty well. So LED is going to need to be about 40% better or so in order to be a mainstream competitor. Replacing linear fluorescent with LED is only cost effective for a few applications right now, especially those with long hours of operation and ones in cold environments. But that's changing fast. So here are some of the key issues you need to be aware of in deciding when to go with LED over linear fluorescent. So obviously cost is going to be one of the big issues. Uh, lamp, lamp life and failure. So linear fluorescent, uh, you can find ones that have 50,000 hours. With LED, 75,000 plus hours is not uncommon. Remember that uh, most lamps are measured, uh, they're measured uh, with their lumens per watt for the lamp itself, where the LED is going to be measured for the amount of light that comes out of the fixture. So you can have a 100 lumen per watt fluorescent tube, but the lumens per watt out of the fixture might only be 80, where you can compare that with an LED that's rated at 100 lumens per watt, and you're going to get all those lumens out of the fixture. Uh, linear fluorescent is a proven workhorse, while 
LED, while promising, is still somewhat of an unproven technology. Controls is an important factor. Frequent switching is not good for fluorescence, uh, where LED doesn't mind that at all. Fluorescent is also less efficient when it's dimmed, where LED actually gets more efficient when you dim it. So the recessed troffer is the most common linear fluorescent fixture, and this represents a big target for LED. And the prismatic lens version is the most widely used and the least expensive. So notice here the high uh, vertical illumination on the walls. So this kind of light distribution can be challenging for the LED to, campaign, uh, to attain because they're very uh, directional by nature. Now the parabolic recess troffer was originally designed to help eliminate glare on computer screens, and it's considered to be a more modern type of fixture. But glare on computer screens is an issue that's mostly gone away because of flat screen displays. A much bigger issue with parabolics is the exposed bare lamps and the overhead glare that bothers a lot of people. You'll notice here the dark upper walls that tend to create a cave effect, and that's because of the sharp cutoff of the parabolic louvers. So retrofitting parabolics with LED T8 lamps is going to be a tempting option, but they can make this cave effect even worse, cause even more glare, and they give the fixture an unnatural appearance. So let's look at uh, retrofitting with LED T8s. So one of the issues is light output with these type of lamps. Uh, Caliper has tested these lamps over the years, and you'll see that the light output is still about half of what you can get with a uh, T8, uh, especially a high-performance T8 lamp. Now they tested these again in 2011, and they're they're getting better, but they still fall short of the light output of fluorescent uh, linear uh, T8s. The light distribution is important to note. You put them in a here's a cross section of a parabolic, which was designed for the omnidirectional light output of a uh, fluorescent lamp. T8 tubes is only getting light out of the bottom part of that tube. Now some have a wider distribution while some have a more narrow distribution. Over here you can see the black line is the distribution for a linear fluorescent. And you can see a different pattern and less light output with the LED uh, T8. The cost, fluorescent T8s can cost uh, $5 or less, while an LED T8 tube is going to cost you uh, $50 or more. There is a safety issue. You can get a UL approval for the lamps, but there's some, still some retrofit installation issues. For instance, you may or may not bypass the existing fluorescent ballast. Another safety issue is future lamp replacement. Let's say you accidentally put a fluorescent tube back into this fixture. That may not be a good idea. Fluorescent lamps uh, are rated for a certain color temperature, and they look pretty much alike. Now, I, I will grant you that it's very typical to put uh, the wrong uh, temperature lamp uh, in these, these fixtures. Uh, that, is, that can be a problem. Now, LED T8s may have inconsistent color, and they may shift over time. And it's important with these color differences, especially when you have lamps that are close together like they would be in a parabolic fixture. One thing that Caliper noticed when they tested LED T8s is that a lot of them uh, failed during the testing procedure, where fluorescent T8s are going to be much more reliable. A much better approach than LED T8s is using LED light bars. These attach directly to the metal fixture housing, and this provides a natural uh, heat sink. So the existing linear fluorescent lamps, lamp holders, and ballasts are all removed. Then you install the light bars along with an LED driver, which is similar to a fluorescent ballast. And uh, this is also the least expensive option. It's going to be around $70 to $80, often cheaper than uh, LED T8s. You're going to have this decision on whether to keep the prismatic lens. Uh, here's an example of what those LED light bars might look with a prismatic lens. So it may not give you the best optics or appearance. 
So a step up uh, using these light bars is to use a kit that comes with a new lens. Uh, this one from Lithonia has a lens that, that matches their uh, popular RT5. From below, it's, it's hard to tell uh, a fluorescent uh, from, a, um, from an LED version. And there's a lot of companies that make this type of kit, and you can get many li uh, lens options. These kits cost from $100 to $150, and they can be uh, very easy to install. The lumens per watt are 90 lumens per watt and often higher. New LED fixtures can also use this type of a light bar. So here's a couple examples of new LED troffers with different illumination approaches. Uh, Fine Light and others use uh, mid-power LED light engines, engines that are similar to the ones that are used to backlight uh, flat screen uh, HD TVs. Now Cree, on the other hand, has chosen to mount indirect reflecting LEDs on top of a decorative room roomside uh, heat sink strip. So it looks like this from, from down below. So the light is bouncing up off the, the fixture and back through this lens. So these fixtures are commonly available in uh, one by fours, two by fours, and two by twos. And two by twos have uh, seemed to be the most popular as they offer the most uniform light distribution in all directions. Most of these new two by two uh, troffers are less than $200 uh, compared to new fluorescent fixtures that are around $100 to $150. Now this is a type of uh, fluorescent fixture that's often used in lobbies, uh, conference rooms, and uh, high-end high office, office spaces. It's usually chosen because it looks good and it tends to minimize glare. However, it's expensive and it's uh, difficult to maintain. So you can get uh, an LED fixture with a similar look and it has a much improved uh, performance. In fact, if you're uh, specifying a, uh, a new building, I would highly recommend going with uh, LED 2x2s. Uh, two uh, one reason for this is that uh, light fixtures are usually the last thing installed in a building, and there can be a two or three year lag time from when a light fixture is specified to when it's actually purchased and installed. So if you specified an LED today, in two to three years, you can be pretty confident that the cost of that uh, LED fixture is going to be down in a range that is going to be very acceptable to the uh, building owner. This is an exciting option that works well with LEDs. For, for very little extra cost, or sometimes no extra cost, you can get LED fixtures that can change their color temperature. Now, this can be done either manually through a, um, a controller, which can uh, change the color temperature as well as the light output, or you can have it set up with a central uh, control system that will change uh, the color temperature, say, throughout the day, perhaps mimicking the, um, uh, the color temperature of outdoor lighting. And you can uh, look at some of these at this uh, Plan LED website. So color temperature, uh, Changing fixtures can have very positive benefits for your mood, health, and your ability to, uh, to see things. If you want to find out more about this topic, here's a website that was just recently uh, launched that uh, covers this topic of uh, lighting for, for humans. Indirect and indirect direct fluorescent fixtures are popular for their low glare and even illumination. It's very common to have uh, lower light levels and then supplement those lower light levels with, uh, with task lights. However, you're not seeing very many comparable LED versions yet. Uh, but Caliper just re released a report yes, or yesterday, I should say Tuesday, I think, uh, suspended LED pendants. Now, while not many of these um, have an indirect component, uh, some of them do, but most of them have a direct component, but they're suspended uh, pendants. One product that has some potential is this edge-lit uh, lumination, uh, suspended luminaire from, from GE, which is uh, translucent when the fixture is uh, turned off, which uh, 
might be an attractive feature when there's enough uh, daylight in the room. The fluorescent wrap fixture is used everywhere it should and many places uh, where it shouldn't. It's a common general use fixture uh, that is inexpensive. Uh, it has a prismatic lens that wraps around the sides and the bottom of the fixture, uh, very wide and even distribution. And uh, it can be surface mounted or sometimes it's pendant mounted. Uh, here's an example of an LED version. Um, I don't know the cost, but I'm sure that it's more expensive than this uh, fluorescent wrap fixture, uh, which you can get anywhere, including Home Depot and Granger and just about anywhere. Um, so this LED uh, version is going to need to be uh, less expensive in order to compete uh, with the, the fluorescent version. HID stands for high intensity discharge and it refers to a, a class of lamps, uh, mercury vapor, metal halide, high pressure sodium. The, the high bay fixture has a, a relatively uh, narrow beam coming out. It's meant to be mounted uh, about 20 feet or higher. Whereas the low bay fixture has a lens at the bottom which uh, gives it a much wider beam and makes it appropriate for uh, lower ceiling applications. Currently, both of these fixtures are being successfully replaced with fluorescent fixtures, which often save 50% uh, or more. And it's also common to attach an occupancy sensor directly to each fixture for additional savings. So while they do make a lot of LED high bays, as you can see, there's a lot of shapes and sizes, but because fluorescent works so well, in high bay applications, it's going to take a while for LED high bays to become a mainstream alternative. The performance is good, but the fixtures are at least twice as expensive, sometimes two and three or three or four times as expensive as fluorescent high bays. But the application that is uh, currently cost effective are ones that uh, are in cold environments, especially uh, large frozen storage uh, warehouses. These buildings usually use high pressure sodium fixtures that need to stay on 24 seven. And that's because it takes so long to come to full brightness when they're turned off. So the LED fixtures uh, work quite well in this environment because they like the cold and they don't mind frequent switching. So digital lumens is one that has been pretty successful in this uh, application. Uh, even though this fixture can cost $700 or more, it's hardly ever on, and the fixtures, once activated, can shut off again after only 30 seconds. So in this way, you can expect to save 90% or more. And this particular um, fixture has qualified for Energy Trust's uh, custom incentives. So because of limited time, I'm not gonna cover outdoor LED fixtures in detail. Uh, some are cost effective now, but I'm finding that most of them uh, are not. Again, it's the high cost of the fixture that's the main obstacles. But some applications you might want to consider are uh, gas station uh, canopies, uh, parking garages, uh, wall packs are becoming more popular, and uh, outdoor lighting. As you can see from this picture, one of the advantages of LEDs for outdoors is that uh, they don't have this yellow glow you get from uh, high pressure sodium uh, which also has a very low color rendering index. Uh, the LED options um, have much more even distribution and um, it has a, a wider light. Uh, for street lights, I uh, wanted to let you know that PG is beginning the process of changing out our street lights to LEDs. Uh, a new tariff that allows this was approved just Tuesday and uh, you'll start seeing uh, us roll out LED street lights in um, uh, beginning of next year. In the future, I believe that the majority of lighting applications are going to use an LED light source, but for, for now there's still other good choices, including fluorescent and even ceramic metal halide for outdoor lighting. So here's a list of issues that, that you uh, need to consider when you're thinking about an LED uh, light source. And in, the, uh, in this list, uh, the best to save for last, you always want to test drive a fixture or retrofit kit you're considering. 
this the best way to evaluate how it's going to perform. Any trust of Oregon has cash incentives that can provide extra money that you may need to make your LED project work out for you financially. Remember, again, you need to use an approved LED product. Some prescriptive cash, cash incentives that are available right now, uh, you can get $30 for LED downlights, either fixtures or kits. One thing I haven't talked about that does have an incentive is LED refrigerated case lights. And there's even extra money if you use occupancy sensors. LED directional lamps, again, one of the best LED options now. And you can get anywhere from $15 to $25 per lamp. If you don't see an LED um, a lamp or fixture on the list, you, can, you may be able to qualify for a custom incentive. But again, you must use an approved product and meet other criteria. PGE and Energy Trust can help you with energy efficiency projects for your place of business. Either go to the PGE website or give us a call and you can get a free energy efficiency consultation from someone like myself or one of our three outreach specialists. Uh, commercial customers should contact Paula Conway and industrial customers should contact uh, John Maloney. So that was uh, that was a lot of material in a short amount of time. I, uh, thanks for sticking with us. And now I want to turn over the remainder of our presentation to Beth for some additional information and to take your questions. Beth? Thank you, Mark. Um, I wanted to thank Mark, and I wanted to remind all of you about some upcoming webinars and seminars that we have. Our next lighting seminar uh, takes place here, um, Better Lighting Lower Cost Workshop on December the 5th in Hillsboro. That's a half-day seminar, free for PGE customers. And our upcoming webinar is Energy Monitoring for Energy Savings on November the 27th. Um, if you have any questions about those or you'd like to register, please uh, go to the website energyeducationcenter.com, and we'll be sending you more information about those shortly. Um, we, in a couple days, we will send you a follow-up email with a recording of the session and the PDF of the materials. You can still submit questions to me through chat, and I'll ask them of Mark here in a couple of minutes. And uh, before I do that, though, I'd like to direct your attention to the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. I just opened a survey, a polling survey. We'd love it if you could take some time to fill that out. We do use your comments to improve our future webinars, and we really appreciate it. And now I would like to proceed to the question and answer portion of the webinar. Um, Mark, the first question we have actually re is regarding outdoor lighting. Um, the uh, writer says, we also have lamp-style light fixtures on five-foot-tall posts, lighting, walk lighting walkways. Are there LED products for this application? There, there are some products that are available, uh, especially for your, for your lower wattage, for ones that uh, uh, may be on a, on a post top. I know there's... Uh, you know, exist, existing uh, fixtures that, uh, you know, have a lollipop uh, or a globe of some kind, and you could put an LED uh, lamp inside of those, and that could work quite well. Um, the, the lower wattages seem to be working the best for, for LEDs in, in, in outdoor. Um, it seems to be a better option once you get into uh, 250 watts or higher that options like ceramic uh, uh, metal halide uh, with electronic ballast uh, are better, but in in uh, ones that are uh, closer to the ground or closer to where you want to illuminate them, uh, LEDs uh, work better. Uh, Bollards is another place where you can use uh, LEDs. Uh, most of the existing ones uh, are very inefficient. Um, LEDs are <laughs> ones are still not real efficient, but they're at least a lot better than uh, than, than their counterparts. So, um, so I wasn't quite clear what that question was asking, but it, hopefully that helps you out a little bit. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. And um, if the uh, person who asked the question would like to send us a follow-up question, we can try to answer that after the webinar. The next question is, um, are ETO incentives available to the residential market as well as the commercial market? And that's Energy Trust of Oregon incentives. Yeah, the, the incentives that we talked about today are for uh, commercial and industrial uh, projects. Uh, currently, they're they're not available for for residential. Uh, 
so with, uh, with, with residential, they're still looking at the uh, compact fluorescence and still installing uh, those as part of a, um, a home energy review that you can get through, through Energy Trust. But uh, right now, there's, there's not incentives for the residential market. Uh, but you can, uh, I'm finding that the, uh, the price of LEDs that you can get at uh, Home Depot and Costco and other places uh, uh, continues to come down. And uh, if you have long hours of operation, uh, paying even uh, 20 or $25 dollars for an LED um, can make can uh, can make sense. So consider those. Thank you, Mark. And our next question is: um, How do you feel about industrial high bay replacements for a steel factory? I think is what they're asking. For a factory application? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the the performance is there. For, for LEDs, and if you have long hours of operation, so if you have a factory with uh, two or uh, three shifts, then it starts looking a lot more attractive. Also, if you have environments that um, have a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of heat, uh, even though uh, you know if, uh, LEDs like it cold, uh, you can design LED fixtures to you know tolerate. Uh, hotter hotter temperatures. Uh, fluorescent, uh, when it gets in hot environments, the, the, the lumen output uh, goes down quite a bit. The same with LED, but not, not quite as much. Um, so again, I think for your industrial applications, uh, the, the key really is the uh, hours of operation to make uh, LEDs a, uh, a practical and cost-effective uh, retrofit upgrade uh, application, and if you can turn them off quite a bit with occupancy sensors, uh, that's another way that you can make LEDs pay off really well. Great. Thank you, Mark. And I had a follow-up um, comment on the outdoor lighting poles question. The application um, in question was uh, for lighting common walkways of an apartment complex. Does that change your answer at all? or? Well, the, uh, the, the LEDs um, can work well in that application, but because the, the lumen output is lower, a lot of times, uh, you know, compact fluorescent can work really well uh, in that application, uh, if, especially if it's an enclosed uh, fixture, which means you can use them for, for cold applications. Uh, but there are some, uh, some, you know, lower wattage LEDs that can work good for walkways. You can uh, they work really well for, for step lights, and you can even get uh, LEDs that, um, uh, that mount in, uh, in hand railings, for instance. That's, that's another uh, good application uh, for that. So for your, for your lower wattage LEDs, uh, for, for walkways, uh, you know, it's going to depend on you know, the cost of the retrofit. Maybe you have to get a new fixture. Uh, so there's a lot of things that come in come into play for that. Another thing that would be beneficial is if they, if you uh, get an LED for outdoors that has some kind of a control in it. Uh, maybe you want you know full light output until uh, let's say 10 or 11 o'clock, but there's not a lot of activity after that time. You can have the fixture uh, with an occupancy sensor that would um, uh, allow that fixture to go to maybe you know, 10 or 20 percent light output still on, uh, but then come up to full brightness instantly when somebody comes by. So you have an application where light levels can be lower much of the time, and uh, that, that can save a lot of energy. Great. Well, I think we have time for one more quick question, and that is um, I'd like to try out a dimensional, a directional, excuse me, a directional LED lamp. What is the best way to get a sample lamp to try, and which ones would you recommend? Oh, that's a that's a great question. I'm glad uh, that was asked. Um, myself and three uh, outreach specialists, we have a, a bag full of uh, different uh, LEDs, and we uh, love to come out to your place of business and let you try out an, an LED. Uh, so if you want to uh, give our team a, a call, uh, we can uh, talk to you, and uh, we can bring out a, a sample and uh, try it out. And uh, what we found is that just about everybody 
that we've gone to that has tried out an LED uh, just loves them. Uh, they they get that they save energy. They get that they uh, save on uh, the cost of uh, and hassle of multiple uh, halogen replacements. Uh, so the quality is there, and the energy savings is there. So uh, give us a call, and we'll uh, bring out a sample lamp, lamp and let you try it out. Great. Thanks, Mark. And that's all the questions we have for today. I'd like to uh, thank Mark and thank all of you for joining us today. We'll stay online a little bit in case any of you have any additional questions. And thank you again.